Yeah, there we go. Hopefully that's coming through okay. Um, yes, yeah, so these are the interfaces. It looks very complicated, but it's, when you boil it down, it is fairly simple most of the time. Uh, the, the interfaces that we use to uh, control the instrument, take observations, uh, etc. Uh, so at the moment, we're looking at uh, an object uh, with an exposure and progress. Um, so we've got a good time uh, left still on this exposure, actually. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions or anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, it looks like okay. the object we're observing right now, we believe is probably a supernova that's been unclassified. We're waiting for our main target, which is uh, M31 or the Andromeda galaxy to get a little higher up in the sky so we can start doing the main part of our project. Um, our project group is called the Salvation, which is an acronym. I think that's the right word, it's, which stands for uh, spectroscopic analysis of luminous variables and transients in our neighbors. So we'll be studying uh, a, spectros or a spectroscopic analysis where we're taking spe uh, spectra uh, of M31 uh, or luminous variables in M31, which is a galaxy just like the M uh, Milky Way, which is really nearby. So we can kind of get a good idea of um, star formation and stuff in within a very similar galaxy, which is nearby. Um, I'm not sure if Roger is here. Maybe. Yes, Roger is here. He popped in for a moment. Um, he's at an event at a friend's house, but uh, he'll be <laughs> okay. he'll be back uh, to his laptop shortly. Yeah, I guess I will introduce myself while we're doing that. Um, the Salvation team. There's, I believe, seven or eight of us now. Um, Roger, Roger is pretty much the head. He's the guy who we use our his credentials for, and um, Monica Saraisam, who is I believe traveling right now, so she was unable to join us. She's kind of the other head advisor for our group. Um, Rafael Nunez, uh, Kevin McKinnon, and uh, I believe Stephanie Figueroa, who is no longer with us, are also unavailable tonight. So it's just me and Richard right now. But. Um, so anyways, my name is Stefan Kimura. I graduated from Willamette University in 2018 as a physics um, major, and I'm kind of debating if I want to go back to school to study astronomy and get my master's or my PhD. But I've been working with the Salvation Group for about two and a half years now. And um, for the most part, I've been leading the observations. But at this point, I've kind of let Richard take the reins and I'm just kind of watching him right now. And uh, Richard, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so Stefan's obviously been with the Salvation Team far longer than I have. Uh, I've only been, uh, I think it's about a month now since I've uh, sort of joined these observations. Um, but yeah, I uh, was I'm originally from Northwest England. Um, went to uh, went to University of Liverpool for undergraduate study, and then did my uh, PhD in Belfast at Queen's University. Um, this is sort of very different to what I've been looking at. I've been using uh, or looking at Hubble data taken with the Hubble Space Telescope um, and actual images rather than spectra, as is the case here. Um, so yeah, this is sort of part of my training up on taking spectra and analyzing spectra and things like that. Um, yeah, and I'm uh, working with uh, Monica, who as uh, Stefan said, isn't available at the moment um, due to travel. Um, yeah, and I think that's a very brief int introduction of myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. if anybody has any questions, please feel free to you know, post them or ask them, yeah, yeah. And I guess if Dan wants to introduce himself up in the telescope room real quick, before we move targets anyways. Oh, you're going to cut me off that fast. Um, you got my three minutes. Yeah. I might be able to fill three minutes. My name's Dan Espinosa. I am a telescope operator, as alluded to, also the chief mechanic slash engineer for Lick Observatory. Um, my job tonight is basically to find the targets that Stephen and Richard 
look for and make sure that we get on them and that the telescope remains pointed where we ask it to be pointed um, in case of we won't get very much, but if we get some clouds or if there's a light source or anything like that, my job is to make sure that we stay on target so that they get data on the object they want and not some other object that might be nearby. Um, I'm also here in case something goes sprawling in the middle of the night. Um, my job is to run out there and try to unsprung it so that we can get back to collecting data. Um, and as said before, I'm happy to answer questions, but uh, I don't have much more to say at the moment. Okay, cool. Thanks, Dan. Um, I guess also, Richard, at this point, are we able, I think we can get you know, a point at N31 already. So if you want to move to one of the N31 variables, Richard, next. Yeah, sure. Um... We'll be almost ready for a new target. Uh, yeah, the so the M thirty one variables will be on the uh, coords list. Yeah, they'll be on that list. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that list that Richard was just showing, we have a bunch of different uh, M thirty ones or M targets within M thirty one that Raphael and Monica chose, I believe, in twenty nineteen, and we've been taking spectra about once or tw or what do you call maybe three times a year when it's up for the last few years, and we've been working to classify. Um, you see that some of them are blue, some of them are red, and some of them are green. So we've classified them as blue stars, red stars, and the green ones are currently unclassified. So we're taking more spectra to figure out their physical characteristics and classifying them. I think Raphael will have a paper out relatively soon. I'm not sure if the sounds are coming through, but those those noises are uh, just part of the software to sort of alert you when uh, various when exposures have finished and it's ready to move on, etc. It's a very very handy uh, notification system, actually. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we have a question here. So the question in the chat, I think it was sent directly to you. I sent it there that I got. And the question is for anyone on the Salvation team, um, can you explain the, um, the Zwicky transient uh, facility and then um, uh, explain what that stream is and maybe tell us a bit about Fritz Zwicky, which is a really awesome character uh, person. And then uh, maybe tell us how you choose your targets, like the ones you're using from tonight from the ZTF stream. Um, yeah, so what we, we get alerts from the ZTF, uh, which is the Zwicky transient facility. Um, they send, we have um, what we call an alert broker, which takes all those alerts and goes through, um, filters out ones that we're interested in. It's called Antares. And then Monica, one of our, um, what do you call it, team members has created another filter, which helps us even find more and more of these um, targets. So the ZTF or the Zwicky, uh, trans, I don't even know, transient facility, does is it takes pictures of the sky in a, in a, a large part of the sky, a wide field, and it takes them maybe I believe it is every 30 seconds or 60 seconds, and then it'll tell and basically checks to see if things have changed in brightness or things pop up, and then from there we take those alerts and then we're look sometimes we can see if they're in our field of view for our telescope if we can want to observe them. So right now we're looking at the first target was what we thought was probably an unclassified supernova, but now we are going back to our main project, which is M31 variables. And honestly, I do not know who's wiki 
Franz Zwicky is. Oh, <laughs> Franz it's Zwicky. Fritz. Oh, it's uh, Fritz. Yeah, it's Fritz, Fritz. Zwicky. Okay. Yeah, I'll put <laughs> I have I'll put the link in the chat. Yeah, everybody. Uh, I believe. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> No, 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 please, please. Whenever, whenever you're ready to move targets, please interrupt me. Yeah. The telescope moving takes priority over everything else. Okay. Hi, everyone. So break, break, break. Did I hear a move request? Yes, please. Yeah. Here we go. Um, and if whoever, yeah, if you can keep the uh, guider up, then, uh, I'll try to talk through what I'm doing while I'm doing it. Not yeah, real yeah. good at multitasking, so I apologize if this gets a little uh, rough. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a position angle. Um, and we'll explain what that is when things are a little calmer. Uh, do we have a, a PA for this target? Yeah, it's 106. 106? Um, sorry. <clears throat> Oh, actually, Richard, for these targets, you usually want to put them into the PA because or the PA calculator because these are longer exposures. That usually works for the oh, standard yeah. stars. Yeah. This is a nine hundred. This is going to be nine hundred seconds of fifteen minute exposure. Okay. Well, he is calculating the position angle. Um, what we want to do is the instrument, as you probably saw just before I switched the mirror, has a literal slit on it. And you want to align the slit perpendicular to the horizon. So the dispersion in the atmosphere, uh, which you can see is the, the red sun at, at sunset, um, helps disperse the light into the spectra that they're studying. And we capture as much light as possible, therefore, uh, with the instrument. It basically what it does is we're we're averaging the the angle at which the slit is to the horizon over the entire exposure. Um, and again, the advantage is that we get a little bit of dispersion from the atmosphere free of charge, and we capture light that would otherwise go to waste if we did not have it perpendicular. Um, currently, you can't see anything in the guider at all because the telescope is pointed to the inside of the dome, which takes longer to move than the telescope does. Um, if you, uh, somebody can pull us over to, uh, let's see, I think it's spare two. There'll be a, that's the wrong one. All right, we'll, we'll pull up the picture in a minute of which telescope we're at. Uh, but this dome is 30 meters in diameter, and so it takes about four minutes to make a full revolution. So now you can see little streaks of light across the guider, and that's the telescope actually moving across the sky. And any bright object that it happens to see makes a streak on the camera. And when we come to rest, those streaks will resolve into little round dots. So right now the streaks are shorter because the telescope's moving slow because it's close to where it, it wants to be. Um, still waiting on that that position angle. Uh, yeah, it should be one zero eight. One zero eight. Okay. Might be entertaining for people to. Uh, watch the sky rotate around the slit in one of these target shifts. Yeah, so one second. I'll just have to restart the viewer because it's just closed one window for some reason. Oh, because of course it did. <laughs> so one second. Let's see. So if the people at home can see the real little red box. Oh, never mind. <laughs> We've got the wrong one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So assuming that we get the picture of the guider back up, what I'm doing right now is I'm comparing the, the stars that I can see to the historical yeah. image of this coordinate. And it's basically doing a jigsaw puzzle really, really fast. Which piece do I want and where does it fit? 
And so now I am shifting over to the view down into the instrument. And uh, the star in the center here, let's see. I'm turning on and off all the markers so that people at home can see what I'm doing. So this little red box that's here in the center, uh, that is where the object that they want to study is going to wind up. And this big black bar is the slit in the instrument. Uh, I am now going to ask the object over on the left, is that going to bother you being in the slit? Um, yeah, it's possible to rotate it slightly to get it off the slit. Sure, I'm going to rotate to approximately 115. Awesome, thank you. And if people, well, actually 110 will probably be enough. So if people at home saw that shift where this object was here and now is here, um, that was the actual instrument rotating relative to the horizon. And I am now going to put the guide reticles on it. Some reticles, reticles. And what I'm doing now is making sure that the computer knows that this is the object I want to use to guide the telescope for the rest of this exposure. You may begin. Great, thank you. So we have finished moving targets. And uh, so we are, whoever was talking about the uh, Zwicky transit, if they remember where they are, they're welcome to pick back up. Oh, thank you. I dropped um, links about Fritz Wiki in the chat for anyone who's interested. Thank you. I think one important fact that I uh, left out was I believe um, it uses the Palomar Telescope or Palomar Observatory in San Diego. So we get a pretty uh, similar field of view to what we can see on our telescope. So most of the alerts we can see will show up and we can observe. I don't know if Roger was here for a little bit. He popped in and then we interrupted him. I don't know if he's still here. He was just here <laughs> with his camera on, but um, I'm sure he'll pop back in. So just to fill some time, there's an interesting connection between the observatory that drives the Zwicky Transient Facility and the telescope we're using tonight. Uh, and that is that the mirror in this telescope was made out of the test blank that they used to determine whether they could make the mirror for that telescope. Um, so you may have heard of the material called Pyrex was a reasonably new invention right after World War II. Um, and because it doesn't move very much with heat, it doesn't expand and doesn't doesn't warp with heat, uh, it seemed like it would be a really good uh, option to make mirrors out of. But nobody had tried to make a piece of Pyrex that big. So they contracted with the Corning Corporation in New York to do it. And the Corning Corporation said, well, let's try it out. So they poured a blank that was about one third the total volume of the, uh, the one that would go into the Palomar tels telescope. And lo and behold, it worked. So they poured the full size 200 inch blank and it cracked. So they poured another one and they cooled it down slower and they eventually made a mirror out of it. Uh, but, of course, Caltech, who contracted for building the Palomar Telescope, 
also owned the test blank. And the guy who was running Lick Observatory at the time was down in uh, Caltech on another errand and walked into the physics department and saw this big hunk of glass at the end of the hallway with a sign on it saying test blank. And so he went to the head of the college and said, uh, yeah, about that test blank, would you be willing to sell that to us? And some wheeling dealing happened. They bought the test blank for $50,000. And the first thing he did was walk down the street to an insurance company and insure it for $2 million. And the second thing he did was arrange with the Southern Pacific to ship it up to San Jose and then hire a trucking company to get it up on this mountain. So the glass in this telescope was a spare part for their telescope. And I can go on and on and on about the history of this telescope, but people would be bored pretty fast, so I'll shut up. Dan, it looks like they have a question for you, actually. Do you find that, uh, Rebecca has a question, do you find that the operation of most telescopes is similar, or have you come across any that have wildly different program setups than others? Uh, yes, they are. I wouldn't say they're wildly different. Um, the sky coordinates that everybody uses is the same and is historically based. I can't even remember who off the top of my head who came up with it. Um, but there are basically two standard, um, movements for telescope this this telescope and the palomar telescope are on equatorial mounts which means that one of the axes of the telescope is parallel to the axis of earth's rotation and the other one is then 90 degrees to that and the other common mechanism that uh, most large telescopes and most brand new robotic telescopes use is the altitude azimuth, which um, is convenient because you can build it anywhere and set it up anywhere and you don't have to worry about getting aligned with the center of the earth or the earth's axis. Um, the advantage to the equatorial is you can track across the sky from horizon to horizon and the image does not rotate. However, with a alt as, the image rotates as you go across the sky. So you need a additional mirror, actually a, a series of additional mirrors that's called a derotator to make sure that the image stays in the same orientation if you wanna do direct imaging. Um, it's not as big a deal for a spectrograph uh, most of the telescopes that I work with are spectrographic telescopes, not direct imaging, uh, but it is a significant difference. Uh, it's almost impossible to point an Alt-As telescope and keep it on an object without computer support, whereas the equatorial, as long as your tracking drive is accurate, you can set it and forget it. So... Um, I could go real deep into the nuts and bolts of operating a telescope, but that's the primary difference. I, I didn't think about how there's different ways that the telescope and the, can move different setups. Yeah, so maybe to go a little bit deeper with it, with an alt as telescope, one of the axes of the telescope is basically passes through the center of the earth rather than parallels to the earth's rotation. And that means that as the object moves across the sky, as the earth rotates, you have to move the telescope in two dimensions at once. And that movement is variable over time. So, you know, if you've got something that's, that's close to the, the equator, say we're looking at the moon or maybe a telescope, not a telescope, but a satellite or something like that. Um, you start with the, the telescope pointed at the horizon and it has to both slew across the, the, uh, the, 
slew around its vertical axis to keep the the telescope pointed at the correct azimuth, which is the angle with which the the object makes or the line to the object makes with the surface of the Earth. But you also have to to move in the altitude, which is the angle the object or the line to the object makes with the horizon. Uh, with an equatorial mount, the only thing that you have to move in an ideal world is the the axis that's parallel with the Earth's rotation. And that's constant because the Earth's rotation is constant over short periods of time. So uh, hopefully that's answered your question. If not, feel free to ask more and I'll try to clarify. Let's see, how many exposures are two more? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if Roger wants, I guess Roger can't present, but a lot of times he talks about a more general part of his research. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sorry, I'm, I have my video. I had my video and sound off because I'm at a big birthday celebration with some friends. Hi, Raja. Good to see you. How are the skies looking tonight at Mount Hamilton? Looking very clear from where I am, but is it clear up there? A uh, little concerned about humidity earlier, but it seems to have rolled off. We okay. have a very thin layer of high cloud. Um, it's less than one mag of extinction, and it's pretty uniform. So I don't see it causing any problem for guiding. I see. And Andromeda is already up in the sky now. I guess it yeah, would be... It should be up pretty much the whole night. So, right, maybe there's an hour at the end when it's uh, it would have set. Maybe, maybe yeah, less. we have about we have a couple of transients at the end of the night. Get possibly, oh, good. good, yeah. And Stephen, you're connected from like the Kona area. Yep. Okay. Staying at home, we have the Ironman triathlon going on right now, so the entire awesome. town is shut down. <laughs> Crazy. Are you operating the telescope with anyone else from the Salvation team? Uh, no, Richard's actually operating. I'm just watching over. Oh, got you. I, I see Richard got, there. Yeah, Richard's, Richard. got the, Richard's got control. Yeah, Richard and I met in person for the first time last weekend. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was in Hilo. I missed you in Hawaii this time, Stefan. Sorry, I didn't spend much time in the Kona area. <laughs> no worries. It's a little, a little far away from Hilo and the... Uh, why me telescopes? I may be back at the end of um, end of November, beginning of December. I may be back in the Waimea area. I'll let you know. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stay on, but I'm going to turn my video and sound off again. I'm in a very noisy place. <laughs> okay. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have as many or interesting targets as we did the other night. Right now, we're just following up on some supernovas. Last week, or last week, last month, our observing nights, we were helping um, Dr. X, one of Raja's colleagues, and they were studying fast radio bursts. So we were able to take some spectra of that. So that was really interesting. And it sounds like they got some good data to add to their research. But tonight, nothing super exciting. We're continuing with M31, you know. Can you please explain? I think I can explain. So most stars that undergo periodic pulsations, 
pulsate due to what we call the kappa. I believe it's called the kappa mechanism. It's where the star, the physical size of the star actually changes. It gets bigger and bigger and smaller. It's kind of like a pulsates usually radially in and out. It's, so when the star is smaller, it's typically uh, hotter and denser. And that means it's also more opaque, which means that the heat and it, the, what do you, the heat and the ra radiation cannot radiate out of the star. So the star gets hotter and hotter, and it forces it to expand. Which, well, as it is, the star expands, the the gas gets a little more. I guess it's not necessarily transparent, but it allows for more heat and radiation to escape. And that causes the star to once cool off a little bit, and it shrinks, and it continues to make do this in like a, in a cyclic uh, manner. It expands and then shrinks, and expands and then shrinks. So different stars do that at different rates. Some stars, um, I believe, we we have a couple of Cepheids, dwarf Cepheids that we are studying that pulsate. I believe within the order of days. And then when I was in undergrad, I studied uh, Delta Scuti stars, which pulsate within the order of minutes or hours. So you can see it really, when if you looked at what you call a light curve, which plots um, a star's brightness or luminosity over time, you would see it kind of jump up and down like a sine curve. And then other stars that go undergo stochastic outbursts, it's due to a stars in binary systems, two stars which are orbiting each other and very closely. And one star is actually sucking mass, sucking mass and the matter off of the other star and getting hotter and hotter. And then it builds. And all of a sudden, when it gets to a certain point, it typically in what we call in typical uh, CVs or cataclysmic variables, it kind of gets to a certain point where nuclear fusion, 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 kick starts again and you get this real quick explosion and blows off all this matter. And you can see it in these stars that brightens usually three or four magnitudes. Hopefully that's a, at least a short explanation of what's going on. Let's see, I can, let me pull up, if I can pull up the page for the star we're looking at right now. You can see what kind of star we're looking at. So according to Sinbad, which is a database, which you can just get a bunch of different properties about this star, if you pull it up, it shows as a LBV or what we call a luminous blue variable star, which is a massive and really bright and really chaotic star, which you see it blowing off a lot, often the brightness exchanges by one or two magnitudes in a couple of days. So we, we try to observe these stars often. Are we about to change uh, targets, by the uh, way? Yes. Just one Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Are you ready to change? Uh, sending coordinates. Right. Yeah. We are ready to move. Okay, this will be my last move, and then I'm going to hand over to Jeff. So here we go. Okay, cool. As soon as I push the right button, that is. 1936. You will not go to space today. Oh, lovely. 
Uh, when we get stabilized on this, I'll need somebody to read off the name for the last target because I forgot to write it down while I was busy yammering on about driving telescopes. No worry, we got it. EBJ. And I didn't get a chance to ask for a PA. Uh, 109. 109. Come on, move. There we go. And you may begin. All right, thank you. And if you'd be kind enough to read off the name of the previous target. Uh, yes, that was uh, ZTF. One eight A B S Q J O K Zebra Tango Fox One Eight Alpha Beta Sierra Quebec Juliet Oscar Kilo. Yes, thank you much. I'm handing over to Jeff, and uh, we'll see you next time. Great, yeah, thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Will you be here tomorrow night, too? I was originally going to, but my sister-in-law's car just blew up, so I'm, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to run a car up to her in Sacramento, and that means that you'll have Sean tomorrow for early okay. night. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Good sure thing. That. Have a good one. I guess, Richard, if you want to pull up the light curve from the target we just pulled on Tara's link, we can talk a little about, bit about that. Uh, yes. Yeah, the uh, one before that. Uh, not oh, that yeah. one. Yeah, that one. That one. That one's a little uh, messier. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can see that if you look at these stars, it's actually getting a little brighter, which is kind of surprising. But if you can, if you see this, it's definitely not a constant brightness. The star has been hopping up and down, up and down for the better part of six years that this uh, the CTF and the Antares project has been uh, observing it. I didn't, if I'm understanding it correctly, I believe LBVs or luminous blue variables are actually really rare. So if this one actually turns out to be an LBV, that would be pretty cool. According to the Wikipedia page, there's only 20 listed. I don't know if that's true or relevant or re 
updated. No, not since 2009. So I'm sure there's more now, but I do know that these are relatively rare stars. They're really, really bright. And typically these bright, bright and hot stars, they live much or their lifespans are a lot shorter because they burn their fuel. They go through their fuel wave quicker. So they're much rarer and they're harder to find. So a lot of times, and then I guess if you want to pull up one of the, I guess the first targets we looked at, Mm -hmm. That's one of the transients down there. Uh, okay. The bottom. Yeah. I think it was. Was this one, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, that one. And then something like this, where you see just on the right, those red and green dots, those are, um, what do you call, record or what do you call observations that we've taken that show that target is getting much brighter. It started at like 20.5 mag down there about a week ago. And by today, it's up to 18 mag. I think it was 18.2 when we took a look at it earlier today. So if you scroll down a little bit, you can see those three pictures. And that first picture are on, the, on the left is what it looks like now. And the picture in the middle is what it looks like usually. It's that what we call a historical image. And that picture on the right over there is the current image minus the historical image. So it kind of shows what changed. So you see that big white dot in the middle is kind of, we think of some sort of explosion or what we think is a supernova. So that is the other part of our project. We're looking at transients nearby. I need to step away for a few minutes. I will be right back. Yeah, no worries. Let's just get these uh, next exposures going. Um, there we are. Yeah, so just to, let's give a quick um, 
a very brief uh, overview of what's actually down here. So this is actually the uh, most recent image that's been taken. Uh, so this is looking at the spectra of the object. So it's not a sort of photograph as such. It's where the light from this object has been uh, split. So it's very similar to, for example, when you put when light goes through a prism and it splits it into uh, the full spectrum from red to blue. Um, that's what's basically more or less happening in uh, this instance here. So the along the x-axis is uh, the wavelength. And so going from, I think it's left to right in this instance, it's increasing wavelength. I think am I in the blue? Yes, I'm in the blue. Yes. Uh, the object itself is actually this horizontal line in the middle. Hopefully that's coming through okay on the uh, screen share. So that's the spectrum of this object. And you can see it gets almost undetectable towards this end uh, on the left-hand side, but going to the right, it gets uh, increases in brightness. And the and those bright lines, there, those are emission lines and absorption lines. So it's really sometimes hard to see the trace. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so this is in the uh, on the blue uh, on the blue side of the spectrum. So for this instrument, the spectrum split into red and blue. It's kind of shown here. So the light comes in from the top through this decker, through the slit, through the filters, and this dichroic splits the light into blue that goes to the left, and red that goes to the right. Obviously, it's not quite left and right in real life, but it's a good sort of demonstration. And so the image down here is this from this blue CCD. And this one here is from the red. And uh, the orientation of this image is uh, all that's different in this. So in this case, the y axis is changing in wavelength. And again, uh, if I just move that out of the way, you can see certainly in the blue it is more distinct, this object, this vertical line in this case. And again, uh, Stefan is saying the now the horizontal lines are um, from the atmosphere, basically. And so, obviously, once we've taken all these data of all these objects that we're interested in, it's we've then got to process it. So we need to obtain the spectra of this object while also accounting for these atmospheric lines and any other objects that might be in the frame, for example. Yeah, I guess I should continue or finish introducing the rest of the members of our team um, and of course, kind of what yeah. everybody what everybody does within the team. Um, Rafael Nunez, he is a, I believe, first year uh, master's student at San Francisco State University. He is, he just graduated from UC Santa Cruz and he worked with Raja. He's been working on this project, I believe since 2019. He's kind of our uh, expert in going through spectra and determining uh, kind of what we're looking at here. You can actually, he'll, he'll look at the spectra and he'll be able to tell, you know, what, which of these, what, what wavelengths correspond to what and what we're looking at, which is something I can't do for sure. Um, he is. He also recruited another member named Joe Bonin. Uh, he is also a graduate student at San Francisco or SFSU, and he's working on creating a, a sort of machine learning uh, algorithm that we can use to take different spectra and uh, classify them. So they're generating different or generating their own spectra right now, and they're looking to classify them uh, automatically, which will be really helpful if we can get clean spectra of these targets. Um, Stephanie Figueroa, who is no longer with us, she just graduated, she, she, she didn't die, <laughs> but um, she is now in the real world. She graduated from UC Santa Cruz as well in last year, I believe. And she just started working, I believe last month. She was initially the one who would take the these uh, spectra and then she would reduce them and she would get the data out of them. But now Monica has been doing that. <laughs> She worked really hard on taking all of the data. She'll be she would be up all night with us, 
taking the data as it comes through and reducing the spectra. She also would post um, ATELs or astronomical telegrams, which kind of tells the whole astronomy uh, community what we found. And well, you know, if there's something like a transient, you know, this is a supernova, this is the type of supernova, and we classify it, and we post those on the ATEL site. Um, Kevin McKinnon is, just got, I believe, just got his thesis actually at UC Santa Cruz. He is a graduate student there as well. All right. He just finished his thesis, and I believe he's almost done with his PhD. He's kind of somebody we look for for any advice, and he's one of the experts in both reducing spectra and observing in general. And then we also have Manan. I can't even, I don't know if, what his last name is, but he is a recently graduated high school student in from India, and he's been working with Raja and the, uh, I believe it's the STEAM program to learn to kind of get his feet wet in the astronomy pro or what do you call it? Field, and he's been helping us. I think he's right now working with Monica on learning to reduce spectra. So he'll be, he'll be taking over for Stephanie, I believe. And I believe that is it. So yeah, there's a lot of us and we all have different jobs within the group. But right now it's just me and Richard tonight, <laughs> somehow. Um, I'll be honest, I not. I don't know if either of us are really I'm, 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 uh, qualified yeah, to speak I'm, about this. I'm not sure about you, Richard. <laughs> um, I'm much more used to photometry, um, so you know, uh, non-spectral images. Um, I definitely gave it gave it a shot. I am not really competent in Python, so I was having a real hard time learning to reduce spectra. But a lot of it take, comes from taking what we see here, this raw data, and removing a lot of the other um, what we call calibration or bias frame bias frames. So we have to remove. So we kind of have to figure out how the telescope, how our telescope observes certain things. I'm not even sure how to how to word this. I'm probably not doing a great job of doing the wording it. But we take calibration, we take all these sorts of uh, calibration op observations in the beginning, as well as um, observations of certain standard stars to kind of see how they show up. And if we know how they show up, what their spectra looks like, we can use that to calibrate and reduce our raw data and get much cleaner spectra. Unfortunately, if Stephanie was here, she'd be great at explaining what she does, but I had a real hard time doing that myself. <laughs>
you know, a lot of um, astronomical observations, depending on uh, exactly what you're looking at, partly, but it's a lot of sitting and waiting for the data, basically, but you've got to keep an eye on, you know, for example, your exposure is still uh, going, there's no issues with that, um, as well, of course, with uh, making sure it's the telescope's still tracking and then checking the weather as well. Um, so all, all these different factors, in this case, split between um, uh, myself and the control room. Uh, but it's still, yeah, everybody's got to keep an eye on different things and um, make sure the data is taken. The data that's taken is uh, a good quality and nothing goes wrong, basically. And a lot of times with the conditions, sometimes we have clouds or the humidity gets too high or, you know, since we're in California, a lot of times there's smoke and there's too much, there's a uh, particle count in the air gets too high. So we have to stay flexible and know, you know, sometimes we're not going to be able to get all the targets we want. We have to kind of look at them and prioritize what data we need to take versus what we can skip for another night. Or sometimes there's like last night or last night, last time we had it in September where we just didn't get on the telescope at all. So we have to stay real flexible and be able to pick different targets or if sometimes when the visibility is not great sometimes we can only see certain brighter targets so we'll have to be we'll have to select different targets so we have to stay flexible that's why we can't just send a target list to the um, operators and say hey send us the data tomorrow morning <laughs> which would be nice but we gotta can't do that You can see right there all the different uh, information regarding the weather, particles, humidity, wind speed. Any of those numbers go into the orange or red, we usually have to shut down for a while, which is unfortunate. But that's how astronomy works. Wait, Jimmy, I thought this, uh, what do you call it? this next session was going to be the following evening. Yes. I mean, uh, perfectly... We're going to have one, we're going to have another one. We're going to have two both nights. I, um, I have that you have a 3.30 Pacific Daylight Time session for, for the 15th. Am oh, yeah, that, you know, that works too. <laughs> um, I'm looking at your planning document. Yeah, I, I have I, I, I have the wrong times on. I don't know how these GMT works, but that works too. We'll still be here. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's uh, 3.30 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I just thought we wanted to do one on su or Sunday evening, like lo local time which is usually when a lot of the school groups join from India and Southeast, Southeast Asia, Africa side. Oh, that would be fantastic. I'm happy to set that up. Um, I did not get an email on that. Oh yeah, no, so I thought I, that's what I thought the time was. Mm. I just misunderstood the, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we can change that. We can change that here. Um, but, I'll, stay, I'll stay on here as we wrap up this session so we can clarify that and I can fix any, I can fix anything we need to do, Stefan. Yeah. And we can still have the session again this evening or later this evening. Yeah. But I know that typically um, the Sunday evening, uh, early Monday morning is when we get like the school groups from India that Raja sets up. So. Yes, I did not. Uh, get any information on setting that up, but uh, we can chat about that just now. Uh, after we, or we can just yeah have it available in case people want to show up. 
Yeah. So I'll need to set that up. I'll chat with you about that uh, just after we end this session. Um, but I, I do want to say thank you, uh, Salvation Team, for allowing us to shadow you. Um, all of the, the details you shared, the introductions, the roles of everyone, so fascinating. And thank you so much for all the explanations about what we were seeing on the screen, um, all of the data, and also to, was it, um, what was the telescope operator who just left? What was his name? Uh, Dan. Dan, yes. And I believe uh, it is Jeff. And also, speaking of which, uh, we are ready for new targets. Sorry. Sorry, Jimmy, to interrupt oh, you, yes, but let's, yeah. let's, let's move to a new target real quick. Let's find it in the list. Uh, I don't know if this is actually in the list looking at this. Hmm. That's kind of strange. It might have a different name too. I don't know. Uh, possibly. But if not, you can just enter it in uh, manually too if worse comes to worse. Yeah. Three, two, five, three. Oh, sorry, I, I could have been reading that out to you. Oh, no worries. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, of course, it's CTF 18, ABII, uh, yeah. EXC. EXC. Okay, now we are ready for you. Okay, send in coordinates. Got it, moving. EA when you have it. This would be 1500 second exposure. Uh, PA is one zero six. Oh wait, Richard, hold on. The the okay. starting HA is negative three fourteen, not not the RA. Oh, have I put the? Yeah, when you're putting it in. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's going to be an updated PA. Yeah. Uh, nine nine ninety nine. Uh, narrow the slit, please.
Okay, I'm guiding. You can open the slide and begin. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool, thank you. Chiachi Mika, um, if you want to have the other Shadow of the Scientist session, I guess that would be in about 30 hours as well, an extra one. Okay, <clears throat> Raja, are you on the call? Okay. Let me have a quick chat with Raja. Yeah. Thank you. And Richard, you can end the recording, stop the recording whenever you'd like. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.